to see you here this morning. I'm excited to be able to see all of you and I want to uh, welcome you and also all of those that are still joining by uh, live stream this morning. We thank you for uh, logging in and joining us for our service. I do want to say as we begin this morning, uh, this is the strangest looking sanctuary, uh, the way that we've got it arranged, but unfortunately uh, it'll be this way for a little while and we will eventually uh, find some sort of normality in here and hopefully be able to close things in a little bit later as the threat of COVID-19 subsides. But I, I do want to thank you for coming and uh, I do want to share a few things with you this morning. Uh, first, uh, we will not take up a traditional offering and since we'll not have people come down and uh, take up an, an offering plate, pass it around. There are, there are two boxes in the back by the doors uh, that you can drop your offering in on either side when you leave today, and we certainly appreciate your faithfulness in giving. We have been most richly blessed uh, by your, your continued faithfulness in giving uh, to our church and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, the invitation will be different today, as you already know, many of you know. Uh, the invitation, you will be able to come to the altar today if you need to, but I will ask you to make sure that you keep distance between you and others if there's someone down here. Uh, what we'll do, though, if you need to make a decision for Christ, there'll be two people in the back. They'll have a yellow tag on that says Decision Guide. When you exit today, uh, just see that person that has that tag on that says Decision Guide, and they'll escort you to the office, and then I'll be right in the office in just a few moments uh, to meet with you at that time. And also, when we dismiss today, uh, we will not just dismiss and let everybody get up as normal and leave. We will dismiss in the same manner that we did last week. Uh, we will have two deacons in the back. Uh, one will be Douglas and the other one will be Mr. Charlie. And he is going, they're going to lead. Douglas will start. He'll empty the rows one by one until we are all out. I'll ask that you do not congregate out in the foyer that you just keep moving so that we do not just get a, a group of people gathered up there at that. I, I must admit this is something different than anything we've ever experienced. And I want you to know, I'm not, it's not original with me in saying this, but seminary didn't teach me anything about this. Okay, I've been flying by the seat of my pants, and I hate to use that word in that manner, but I've been flying by the seat of my pants for three months now, and we're winging it one day at a time to get through this, and we, we don't know what the total outcome is going to be, but we're just going to keep moving forward until we get there. But I, I do want to once again thank you for your continued faithfulness 
not only in your giving, but in your prayer and in your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and to our church, our community, our state, and our world uh, during this time when this pandemic is, is running rampant in our society. At this time, I'll ask you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. So please bow with me. Father, as we bow this morning, we're humbled and, and thankful to be able to gather in your presence and worship once again together. Father, we know that a pandemic didn't stop us from worshiping. We still worship. It just changed the way that we worship. And Father, as that happened, it also caused the gospel to go outside the walls of the church in ways that we never could have imagined or fathomed. And I pray that you will use every feeble attempt that we uh, put forth to spread the gospel, that you will use it in a way that will minister to people and that your word will not return void, that it will accomplish what it has set out to do, what it is intended to do. I ask you today to turn all of our hearts to you to cleanse us from any unrighteousness that would hinder the message today and that would hinder your work, whether it is with the people in this building or the people listening by internet or the people who will listen to the video later on. We just pray that you will use this for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth.
Through these trials, you've always been faithful. You bring healing to my soul. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will. Amen to that. That is absolutely wonderful. You know, if I had been given talent, that would be the talent I would want. I would want to be able to sing, but also not just sing with a beautiful voice, but be able to interject the emotions and feelings into that. And so that's an absolute wonderful, wonderful thing. I, I want to say once again, this is the second Sunday in a row I've preached to people that I could see. Now, that is not to say that our musicians and our sound people, uh, sound technicians, are not people, but they get the blunt of the messages. They can't hide from me when I'm preaching because I'm focused on them. And so uh, now they can kind of blend in a little bit and they don't get the blunt of the messages when I'm preaching at them because they, they probably feel pretty beat up by the time they leave here on a Sunday when it's just them and me uh, in here. And uh, it's a little bit different preaching to a camera uh, when no one's in here. Well, no one other than our uh, normal people, sound technicians and musicians. I want to make sure that I don't exclude them. But today I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we're going to pick up at verse 57 and go through 62. And today I want to tell you that we need to count the cost. We have to stop and think about things and, and, and understand the cost that's associated with things. We sometimes don't do that. Sometimes we uh, just kind of act in a moment, and uh, we don't really take, in, take into consideration the long-term effects of something. One of the things that I've noticed, uh, uh, especially in sales, uh, like campers or boats, people will kind of, what they say, binge buy those things. And they'll buy them because they offer a great finance rate and you can finance them for 20 years and, and uh, pay a small amount for the rest of your life. And, and then people buy them and, and they, they go in, they don't think through the associated cost with it. They buy this thing and they realize that it's parked in their yard. It's been parked out there for three years and they've been somewhere with it one time. And then they're still paying on it and so they discover that uh, we need to sell this thing. We need to get rid of this. I should not have bought this thing when I did, but I was moved with emotion. I was moved with the charisma of the salesperson that, that led me into this. But, you know, we blame salespeople, but can I tell you, it's not the salespeople. It's really that we haven't counted the cost of something when we jump into it. And in this passage, what we're going to look at is the cost of discipleship, the cost of becoming a disciple, the cost of becoming a child of God. There's cost associated with that. Yes, salvation is free, and I want you to know that. Salvation is most definitely free to you and to me, but it wasn't free for Jesus. And I want you to know, even though it's free to us, there is a cost associated with that. It brings a lot of change into our lives and it, things turn into a whirlwind sometimes and it appears that there's a tornado lighting on our lives and that everything is just spinning into oblivion. But I want you to know that sometimes when we calculate the cost, we may not understand everything, but we've taken into consideration what could happen, at least to the best of our ability, and we've made a sensible decision. One of the things that Tammy and I have done through the past several years is before we make a huge purchase, 
I'm, I'm not talking about going, maybe we should do that before we go to Walmart. But anyway, when we, when we make a, a big purchase, something that's going to require payments, you could do that at Walmart too, huh? But anyway, something that's going to require payments, we'll take 30 days and pray about it before we actually make that decision. Let me tell you why. Because in that 30-day period, the excitement wears down. We begin to question whether or not we really need this specific thing, this whatever item it may be or purchase that it may be. So we begin to consider that. And usually what happens is we talk ourselves out of it before we sign on the dotted line. And so that's not necessarily a bad practice, and I'm not telling you to adopt that practice, but it works for me, and it works for Tammy, and so we embrace that. And so calculate the cost, and that's what I want you to know today. You have to calculate the cost associated with things. Now, in this particular passage, Jesus has left Samaria because he was not accepted in Samaria, and they left. Matter of fact, I, I, I just need to share this with you just for a little information purposes. Peter and John wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn the people up. And Jesus, no, 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 no. We don't want to burn the people up. We don't want to kill the people. We want to give them salvation. And they had to understand that. And sometimes miscalculating costs comes because we misunderstand what we're doing and we're not really un getting the big picture. And so it happened that after this happened and he left Samaria that he encountered two different people and these particular individuals wanted to follow him but then Jesus told them there's a cost associated with this and they both were unwilling to follow after they calculated the cost it's going to require something of you but you know what sometimes what the gospel requires of you what Jesus requires of you is for your benefit it's not to cause harm to you. Anytime we adjust our lives, it's always a discomfort associated with that. But I also want you to know that some of the things that God takes out of our lives are much needed things that need to be removed. And they also bless us because they're no longer a part of our lives to pull us down and to drag us down. Now, everything that we give up doesn't drag us down. Please don't misunderstand me on that. But there's some things that we do need to give up. And we have to calculate the cost associated with it. In this passage, in verse 57 of chapter 9, reading through verse 62, it says this, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, what a response on this. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to them, No one, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father, I ask you to take this message. I ask you to use it, and may it challenge us. May it draw us closer to you in our walk and our relationship with you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The message I want you to know is not intended, because we're going to be talking about looking back a little bit, the message is not intended to make the past appear to be something we should never reflect on. And that's what, what Jesus was doing when these people were looking back at their, at their lifestyles and, and, and having things that they needed to do and so forth. He was never intending to make the past appear to be bad. Uh, although throughout the Bible, God instructed people to reflect on the past. And typically that reflection had to do with his provisions that he made for them because we need to reflect on the provisions that God has made for us, for you and me, because reflecting on those things and remembering those things, we in that we find strength to go forward to another day when we don't understand exactly what we're facing or the outcome of it or anything of that nature. We find the strength to move forward. 
And so he primarily, for, primarily for two purposes, instructed us to look back. First one was that we were to reflect on provisions, the provisions of God during times when evil had us in its clutches. But to, sometimes we, we should just reflect on what God has done in our lives. But the second thing in reflecting back is that reflecting can be a warning to us not to repeat previous mistakes. Someone said to me this week, and I looked it up, we were talking about our nation, and, and uh, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. And I looked it up, and that's attributed, the, the author's a little bit uncertain on that, so, but I, I'm not the original one who said it. And I believe that we need to look back so that we don't return to a place that we shouldn't have been to start with. And so we learn from previous generations. We learn from previous mistakes. We learn in church what didn't work and what will work. We learn by doing different things sometimes, and that can be hard in and of itself. What was Jesus referring to? Well, what Jesus was referring to here was the associated cost with anything we do. It doesn't matter what you do, friends. There's, there's going to be a cost associated with it. You're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to invest yourself in something. I remember years ago when I graduated high school, most of the people that I graduated with went on to trade school. But then there were those that did go to college. They didn't go to college to learn anything. They went, let me just be honest with you, they went to party. They partied for one semester, they got kicked out, and then they got a job like everybody else. But they had that one semester. They had fun for that one semester, and they partied on their money, but they didn't count the cost. They weren't willing to contribute what was required of them in order to be successful in the task that was laid before them. They were given a chance, and they blew it. And sometimes what happens is when we blow those chances later in life, we look back and we say things like, I wish I had them. I wish I hadn't have. And we say things like that, but let me tell you, when I did go back to college in the academic side, I paid my own way. And I learned a lot. I didn't party. I didn't squander. I was paying for that. I wanted every bit of what I could get out of it as I went through it because I was paying for it. So I wanted to learn. Did I agree with everything? No, I didn't have to agree with everything. But nevertheless, we have to look and count the cost. No one can move forward, though, if they're always looking back or living in the past. Now, there's a difference there. Sometimes we want to live in the past. You can't live in the past. I can look at people, and you can do the same thing. I'm not going to name any groups, but I can look at people and tell you what era they're living in. I can tell you if they're living in the 1960s just by their dress. I can tell you if they're living, well, I, I used to tell you if they're living in the 70s. The 70s styles come back into play now. I must tell you, if you like bell bottoms, God bless you. I just wanted to say that. Bell bottoms is not my thing. I had a pair of bell bottom pants, and I hated to wear them. They were like a parachute. You could jump off this building and float down. It was horrible. But we, we're repeating things. We go back, and, and you can look and tell if people are stuck in the 80s. You can tell if they're stuck in the 90s and if they're living in the past. But I want you to know that what will happen if we are living in the past is that we will find that our service to God will be half-hearted and very uncommitted. We want to make sure that we have calculated the cost in serving our God. Serving God... It's not based on our terms, it's based on his. And in this passage, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, these men put conditions on the service. I'll serve you, but, but, I've got a condition. In other words, I'll serve you on my terms. I'll serve you the way that I think is the best way. I'll serve you only if it will work around my schedule. I'll do what you call me to do as long as it doesn't interfere with my life 
as long as it doesn't cause anything to be out of shape or out of place or out of way, as long as it doesn't cause any discomfort, as long as it doesn't cause any confusion, as long as it doesn't cause me to have to do anything that I don't want to do, and, and it'll be in my time and my way. But let me tell you something. Serving God is not on our time. It's on His time. Serving God is not the way we want it. It's the way He wants it. Serving God is about surrender and giving our lives to Him. And sometimes we miss understand exactly what that means and we're going to talk about that as we move through this sometimes people that that he spoke with they were looking into their past they were looking back and when you look and live in your past not reflecting on the past but when you live in your past what will happen is you fail to live in the future I'm um, in the present and then you can't move into the future the way that you need to we must do different things sometimes because God requires it they they couldn't seem, these people couldn't seem to let go of life. And, and they couldn't seem to let go of the things that they, that they cherished there. They didn't count the cost. Sometimes people act in a whim of emotion and they begin to surrender. And they say things like, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. But then all of that seems to fade very quickly when the cost becomes very evident in their lives. No one is ever called to serve in the same capacity. Please hear me on this. I've got some points in here lined out that I'm going to get to in a minute. But no one is called to serve, not everyone rather, is called to serve on the same, in the same capacity. Not everyone's called to be a preacher. Not everyone's called to be a pastor. We have to accept that. Not everyone's called to be a missionary. Not everyone's called to be a musician. Not everyone's called to be in those specific places or, or seminary professor or college professor. Not everyone... Uh, in a Bible college or anything of that nature, just something like that. Not everyone's called into those specific vocations. But what I've discovered is that God calls people in the banking industry. God calls people in the business sector outside of the banking to be ministers of the gospel. God calls people as school teachers to be missionaries in a unique field there. God calls people to do different things at different times. God calls some people to be deacons. God calls some people to be door greeters. God calls some people to just simply be kind, and by the way, I think he's called all of us for that, to people. And some people have the gift of gab, so to speak, and they're able to carry on conversations with people. They have the ability to talk, and therefore they soothe people, they minister to people in times when they really need it. And God has called you where you are to do what you're doing, and if you remain there, you'll have the biggest impact that you could ever imagine because you're in the center of God's will. People will have you believe that if something is going wrong in your life, then you're not in God's will. That's not so. And the Bible proves that over and over and over. You say, well, why, I mean, why would everything go perfect? Let me tell you something. Jesus was perfect and they crucified him. Why do you think it's going to be easy for us? Let me tell you this. Paul was a man that was religious, but then he, he sold out to Jesus, and then he went to jail over and over and over. I mean, he, was, he had a rap sheet that was unbelievable. I mean, can you imagine what his resume looked like and the way that we would address it today? Man, this guy's been in prison. We, no, no, no. We, he, he's been in prison three times. Wait a minute. Look at that, his record. It's his public record. He's been in prison five times. This man, what has this man been thinking? You see, we put everything into our standard and our way of understanding. But please notice that in verse 57, and let me read that to you. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. These people volunteered for service, but they did not have a clear understanding of what they were volunteering for. Now, I'm not sure that Jesus said, oh, here's your job description. I don't know that he did that. I don't think he did that. I really don't. I don't think he had one typed up waiting to pull out and say, here you go. Just follow this job description and you're good to go. That's not how it worked. Sometimes we get caught up in the emotions of the moment. Sometimes we make emotional decisions that we've not prayed about or that we've not calculated the cost on. 
If we volunteer to do something and our heart's not in it, then we'll either quit or not take it seriously. And so this is very important. I've told you this before, and I'm not knocking anybody, but when I surrendered to preach, there was four of us that went down front. Only one of us ever actually went into the ministry. I don't guess you have to guess who that one was. The other three didn't go into it. They, they never even went forward with it from that point. They never did anything with it. Later, there was a young man that surrendered to the ministry, and he went into the military, and he's now a chaplain in the Air Force. And so when you, when you surrender to God, it means that you give it all to him. Serving Christ means that we should not try to live in the past or in the places that we've left behind. Matter of fact, I've always considered it a bit unethical. I'm speaking this, speaking from a pastor standpoint. I've always considered it to be a bit unethical for a pastor to leave one church and move two miles down the road to another church. I always consider that to be a bit unethical. Am I saying that you shouldn't do that? I'm saying that I don't think at this point in my life I would do that. I think if you leave, you need to leave. You need to leave the people alone because if you move two, li- two miles down the road, then people will sometimes follow you. Sometimes they will, they will not allow you to go. Sometimes you will not let go of them. And I think you need to move. Now, I know pastors have done that and had a successful ministry, and that's fine. But as my opinion for me, I personally think when you leave, you should leave. And Jesus responded to his followers because if you notice... What Jesus required of them, they said, we'll follow you. Jesus was traveling. He was leaving town. He was getting out of Dodge, so to speak. He was moving on. And these people wanted to follow him, but it had to be under their conditions and terms. And Jesus sets the record straight that you cannot follow him on our terms. And and, and I, I have to follow him on his terms. But let me tell you. What he, how he responded to these would-be followers. He erased the notion that it would be glamorous. Why would people be drawn to Jesus? Because it was glamorous. Man, everybody knows Jesus. Here's this Jesus fellow coming. Who is, look at the people around him. I want to, to get into this. I want to be noticed this way. And Jesus wanted them to understand that it's not always this glamorous, that it's not always this exciting, that what you see is not what the way it is all the time. Sometimes there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that people don't know about. You may, it may appear to be glamorous, and you may think that you would gain notoriety and prominence among people, and you may, you may become a public figure, or rather you will become a public figure, but you may not become a star. I want you to consider John the Baptist. He was not called to be a front runner. He was called to be a number two guy. He was called to be the second person, and he would fade out of the way when Jesus stepped up to the scene, but he understood his ministry. He understood that his ministry was there, and it was part of launching out the Messiah because he came crying with a voice from the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. And as he did that, he subsided, he, he declined, and Jesus increased. And so that was a, a beautiful thing to experience. Now, in order to prepare your heart for service with God, please know this, you must count the cost. But then we might ask the question, how do you count the cost? Let me share with you four ways of how you count the cost. First, it's real simple. You just simply sit down and you count the cost. You, you calculate it out. What is this going to require of me? What is going to be required of me? It's not always going to be glamour. It's not always going to be fun. When I surrendered to the ministry, my pastor told me, he said, if you can do anything else and be happy, then you need to do it. I thought, what is wrong with him? I surrendered to the ministry. Why aren't you happy with me? And later, I figured it out, because if I could do anything else and be happy, then I wouldn't call to be a preacher, a pastor. And so, he clarified that for me. He, he set the tone for that. Count the cost. You might, I might, you might ask have I, yourself, have I really considered the cost? What is associated with this? You might ask yourself this. Am I only seeking the glamorous side of things, or am I only seeing the glamorous side of things? 
we look at the glamorous side of things and it draws us in and we don't always know what goes on behind the scenes. When I surrendered to the ministry, the, the secular job I worked at, the owner of the business, his son came out and said, man, you've got it made now. I said, what do you mean? He said, you'll only work two hours a week. I think I'm going to faint, people. I think I'm going to pass out up here. I, I mean, the blood began dropping. It began leaving my head. I don't know what happened. But I've not had any of those weeks. I'm not sure where he saw ministry, but he didn't see the same ministry I quickly learned that existed. He didn't see that. He didn't see the phone ringing at 2 o'clock at night. He didn't see people calling you uh, on, uh, on a Friday evening and they have a major crisis in their life and they need to talk with you that nobody will ever know about. He didn't see any of those things. He didn't see when you're sitting behind the scenes and you're talking to a couple that their marriage is on the rocks and they're contemplating divorce and they've come to you as a last resort to try to reconcile things and you've got a lot of weight on you because you want to see these people survive. You want to see their marriage thrive. You want to see them come together and therefore you have a lot of weight on you and you do that and you pray for them, you cry for them, you, you're broken for them. They don't see those things. And we don't talk about those things. They don't, they don't understand all that's associated with it because they see one side of things. Many of you in your jobs, your careers, it looks easy to me from where I'm standing. But if I were to get in there where you are and roll up my sleeves, I'd realize that it's not quite that easy. I realize that it's a lot more complicated than I ever thought it was. So we have to count the cost. We have to ask ourselves, are we looking at the glamorous side? But we also have to ask ourselves this when we count the cost. Was this decision to follow Christ based solely on emotions of the moment? Is the Holy Spirit leading me? You say, well, how do I know when the Holy Spirit's leading me? You will never have peace in your life until you surrender to God. I want you to know that you, you won't have it. It won't be there. It will not exist. Until you surrender to God. But if you are moved in an emotional decision, oftentimes what happens is you move with the crowd. You go with the group. You go with the people. You go with the grain. But you'll discover quickly when you surrender to Christ that you'll become a, a lone wolf. That you'll just simply find yourself out there by yourself. That people won't understand and people will offer all kinds of advice to you on what you should do and how you should do it. And by the way, a lot of that advice is not necessarily bad, but it comes from people who's never walked in that position. And they can't advise you on these things. They can't do that. Not adequately. But the second thing, we should count the cost. We should calculate it. But the second thing, it's a choice that no one can make for you. What do I mean by that? What does it mean that we choose to follow Christ? It means that I am the one making the decision that Christ has called and I've responded. That's what it means. Years ago, in a previous church, God bless the lady, she's gone on to be with Jesus. But I want you to know, uh, she had some tactics when it comes to the children that were wrong. She was a wonderful lady. But in her Sunday school class, she'd tell them, okay, you're 12 now, you're 13. It's time for you to go down today uh, during the invitation and tell the preacher you're going to accept Christ and you need to be baptized. Okay, that wasn't her decision to make. I'm sorry, but that's not her decision. Now, what that leads to is children who grow up and they get a little bit older and they begin questioning whether or not it was a genuine response or whether they acted because they were instructed to. Let your children decide for themselves whether or not Christ is calling them. It's a decision that only that person can make, that only I can make. No one made a decision for me to surrender to the ministry. Matter of fact, I had more people tell me I was crazy than, than, uh, than ever supported me in the decision to surrender to ministry. People didn't understand. They said, but you have a home. You have a good job. Your wife has a good job. Everything is established. Let me tell you something. My father could not understand this. My dad said, you've got everything going in your direction. You've got a good life. What are you doing? 
You're giving all of this up. Let me tell you something. At first, I thought I was giving up something, but I gained far more than I ever gave up. God has blessed me through the years. He has blessed Tammy through the years. We have been given so much in our walk with God and, and in our service to Him, and it was a choice that only we could make. No one could make it for us. And let me tell you, if you're married and you're going to surrender to the ministry, it's two people making that decision. Please hear me. Two people. Because... You may be called to the ministry, but your wife has to be called to be a preacher's wife. And if she's not, you better back up and start praying. We make a decision to follow him in salvation. Matter of fact, in Acts 16, 31, he associates a little bit with this, the cost of it. He says that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be saved. But he adds something. One reason I love that verse is because he adds something to that. And thy house. In other words, your family. Wait a minute. Can I get my family saved? Am, am I responsible for saving my family? You're responsible for introducing them to Jesus. But can you save them? No. What is he saying? Let me tell you. Your children, the people in your house, they look up to you. And I want you to hear me on this. Whatever mama and daddy does, especially daddy in most cases, the children are going to do the same thing. If dad respects mom, children are going to respect mom. If dad lives for Jesus, it's a good chance the children will live for Jesus. It's not a guarantee. Because please hear me. Children grow up and they do their own thing. And I'm certain of this. I'm absolutely convinced. I know from experience that children grow up and they do their own thing sometimes. But we give them the foundation and we lead them to Christ because being that role model in your house has an influence on them. We follow him in salvation, but we also follow him in service. These go hand in hand. We follow him in salvation. We follow him in service. In other words, it's not conditioned on what I think it's conditioned on, but it's, it's based on his service and what he's called me into. I don't get to choose the conditions. He does. But then we follow him in sacrifice. Sometimes what we think we're giving up is actually a huge blessing in our lives. We're giving up things that can harm us and, and maybe even uh, cause us to miss some of the greatest blessings that we've ever, ever could have experienced. But we follow him in sanctification. In other words, we're growing in Christ. We're progressing in our walk with him daily. Now my question is, before we move on to point three, is will you choose to follow Christ completely? Will you do that? Now notice that. I used the singular word you, not plural. It's a singular word because only you can decide that. Now, the person next to you, the person on the other side of the room, they can't decide that for you. Only you can do that. But I want you to notice this. Not only when it comes to calculating the cost, not only is it a choice that, that no one can make for us, it will not always be convenient. Now, I want you to notice, as they walked, one of the men in verse 57 said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus' response in verse 58 was kind of like one of those responses where you go, whoa, what did he mean by that? As he progresses on, we'll see what he meant by that. But as Jesus said, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, Jesus said, I don't have a home that I purchased that I'm going back to to live in. I, I don't go home at night. I don't go out in the daytime and go back at night to my quaint home and my surroundings and, and so forth. I don't, I don't have that opportunity. I'm traveling. In other words, I lay my head wherever comes up, whatever place shows up next. Wherever the Spirit leads me is where I go. People have asked me through the years, Preacher, is it hard to move? Yes, it's always hard to move. Yes, it is. It's always. You know, even if the conditions aren't the greatest in the world, you still love people. You still love the, the people, and it's hard to leave. It's always difficult to do that. And then you, you consider when you leave one place to another, you have to move all of your business to a new location, and that's timely and costly, and, and you have to get adjusted. It's a lot involved in it. But it's never convenient. And so 
I, I want you to consider this. There's never a good time to follow Christ. You say, well, what do you mean, preacher? Let me say it this way, and it'll make more sense. There's never a convenient time. You say, what do you mean by that? Let me tell you, it wasn't convenient when I surrendered to the gospel because my life was in order. My life was fixed, and it was about to disrupt everything that I knew. Matter of fact, it did disrupt everything. So it's, it's not always convenient, but it's always a blessing. If, because if we act, God will do something great. Now notice, in this passage, two people responded. It was not convenient for them at that given time. Now please notice this. The first man said, let me bury my father. Boy, that's a, I mean, that sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? And so in verse 59, he said to another, Jesus invited him, follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Wait a minute, here's the condition. I need to bury my father. No, no, you have to understand the, tra the, the, the tradition and the culture in order to really appreciate what he's saying. He's not saying that my father's on the brink of death. He's probably, this guy was probably the oldest son and was going to gain inheritance of two-thirds of the estate. And so what he was saying is, let me stay home until I get my inheritance. Because his father may have been a young man. May, may have been fairly young. I don't know. But he was saying, let me stay home until my father dies and I get my inheritance. And after I get my life fixed, after I get my 401k fixed, after I get my retirement in place, after I get all everything laid out the way that I want it, after I do this, then at that point, I'll be ready to follow. Let the dead bury the dead. It, it, it's, that's what Jesus said. Now, what does he mean by this? Let the dead bury the dead, bury their own dead. Wow. Now, the word dead is not always associated with the exact same thing in Scripture. He says sometimes that if you look in Scripture, it'll say that we're dead to law or we're dead to sin. Does it mean that I'm dead? No. But I'm dead to sin. What does he mean? He's using it to say in terms of influence. I'm dead to the law. The law has no influence on me. I'm dead to sin. This sin has no influence on me. And so he said, let the dead bury the dead. Let, the, let those who have no influence go and bury them. Let those who are not going to spread the gospel go and do this. This can be done by others, but you will be a person of influence, making a difference in people's lives. And sometimes you have to go. You have to go when he calls. And we have to respect that and respond to that. So the first one said, as soon as I get my inheritance squared away, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back. It, it may take two or three, four, five, six, eight or ten years, but I'll be back. Lord, I'm, I, 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 just, just mark it down, Lord. I'll be there. I'm coming back. Just let me know where you are. I'll try to keep up with you. And wherever you are, I'll come when I get everything squared away. But then we have the second man. It says in verse 61, And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid farewell to who, uh, those at my house, basically. To all those that are there. Let me go tell them bye. A and then Jesus responded uniquely. But let me tell you why this would not be acceptable. This would have led into a celebration. They would have thrown a going away party that probably would have lasted several days. And Jesus was not going to be in that particular spot for several days. In other words, I can't wait on you to go take care of your business and to go have a farewell party and to go have a send-off party. You've got to come with me now if you're going. You don't have time for this. And Jesus explained it to him this way. A man putting his hand to a plow, looking back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. What does he mean by this? Have you ever plowed a row? Have you, ever, have you ever plowed? I know uh, the younger generation may not have plowed in some regard or another, but the older generation and many that have been associated with some type of farming have, have made rows. I remember my dad saying when he was a child, they plowed with mules, and, and they were sharecroppers. And, and as they plowed, my dad said he was a young man, he's basically a kid, and his dad was a very strict individual. Not anything wrong with that. 
But he told him, said, son, I want those rows straight. He said, come here, come over here and look at these rows. And he said, these rows look like a snake down through there. And he says, because he was doing this and he was doing that and he was looking back and he was not giving himself to the task. And so a second time, he said, son, I want those rows straight. The third time came around. My dad said when his dad got through, he said those were the straightest rows he ever plowed in his life. He said he just needed a little bit more explaining on how to do it. And he said when his dad got through with that plow line on him, that you could shoot a gun, a rifle down that row and not touch dirt on either side. He said it was the way that it was supposed to be. Jesus is saying this, if we're always living in the past, then we can't move forward to benefit the kingdom of God. And I've witnessed this time and time again. I have a good friend that I love dearly, but for years he always tried to move back home. He was always looking for every opportunity he could to move back home. Let me tell you something. I don't want to move back to the place that I used to call home. It's not home anymore. Let me tell you where home is. Home is where the heart is. That's where home is. And if your heart is with Jesus, your home is with Jesus. If your heart is with the people that that you're pastoring, that's where your home is. If your heart is in your service to Christ, that's where your heart is. If your heart is is in a missionary field in Zimbabwe, that's, that's where your home is. If your heart is right here in Meridian, Mississippi, if it is in the workforce where you're making a difference for Christ, then that's where your home is. That's where you're supposed to be. We cannot live in the past and move forward. And so if we choose to live in the past, basically we refuse to move in the present, and therefore we will never be able to accomplish what Christ has for us, and we'll miss some great blessings. But then the final point. It's not always, it will not always be comfortable. It won't be. And I I won't, please understand me. I've heard this so many times, and I want to tell you, I've said it. What am I doing wrong? Why is this so difficult? Why does everything, why is everything so hard to do? It must be me. It must be that I'm doing something wrong. What is it? Sometimes it's not about doing something wrong. It's about learning how to do something the way that God wants it done. And that causes discomfort in doing that. No matter what your vocation is, there will be things that you like and things that you don't like about it. It doesn't matter what it is. And sometimes we think, uh, you know, boy, I'd like to do something else. You know what? I'm sure that everybody's this way to some degree. But I I remember sitting with a group of preachers and they asked one time, if you could do anything else, what, what would you do? I don't know. Probably go back to a dealership where I came from. I don't know. But you know, after saying that, I told Tammy not long ago, I'd hate to know that I had to go back in that dealership and work on automobiles again. You know, you get to a point where your body just can't handle those things. It just doesn't respond to what that it used to. Let me just go ahead and make it plain. I'm not 20 and 30 years old anymore. And even though my brain wants to react like I'm that age, my body says, whoa, 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 stop right there. You are not going to do that. You are going to pay the price if you do that. And you're like, oh, oh, and and you pay for it. It's not always comfortable. But let me tell you, doing what God does will sometimes cause discomfort to you as well. But growing... And trusting means that we allow God to lead. God will at times put you in positions where we can learn to lean on Him. Where we can learn to do this. And and this is important because especially if you're a type A personality. If you're a type A personality, that means that you struggle when you're not in control. That means that you struggle if you don't have a plan laid out. Let Let me go ahead and describe a type A personality to you. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Can I tell you who's type A? 
Can I tell you who struggles with the type A personality? I, I thought about this. I couldn't tell you how many times that I've told my wife, I'll fix it. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And then, and then I sometimes bite off more than I can chew, so to speak, or I've not counted the cost, and I realize, oh, wow. I, I didn't want to do this. But then I, I had no choice. I'm too far in, and, and I have to go ahead. And, and then, I, again, I don't want her to think, well, you know, uh, he bailed out on me. You know, I'm like, you know, you're in pain, but you're smiling when she comes around. When she leaves, you're like, oh, man, what did I do? What did I, what did I get? And then she comes back, would you like a cup of coffee? Oh, I'd love one. Would you, would you like to come sit down for a minute? No, 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 I don't want to stop working. But what you're really saying is if I sit down, this can, you're going to have to call the deacons to get me up. That, that's what you're saying. Because I'm going to stiffen up so bad that I'm not going to be able to move and I've got to keep going. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to do what God wants us to do. Sometimes it's uncomfortable because we're challenged outside of what we're familiar with. We're called to sometimes leave families. Sometimes we're called to reach out to people that, that would uh, be indifferent than we are. Uh, different opinions and things uh, that, that maybe we don't agree with in our lives. But let me, let me go ahead and say this and I'm going to close in a moment. Please know this. This is something, that, and I've said this multiple times, but I need to say this again. Right now in our culture, if you don't agree with me, I don't like you. That's the mindset of everybody. If you're entitled to your opinion as long as it reflects my opinion. That's the way our culture is. Please hear me. We've got to learn that we have differences of opinions, and it's okay. We can talk about it without wanting to kill each other. We can actually, now, now listen to me, we can actually learn from each other. Tell me why you believe the way you believe. Let me tell you why I believe the way I believe. You know, we can learn from one another. And we have to relearn this. It's not always comfortable doing this, but nevertheless, it is very, very important. Please hear me. Your comfort is not determined by your likes or your dislikes. Your comfort lies in your confidence in Christ. Did you hear me? Uh, let me repeat that. Your comfort and my comfort is not determined by our likes and our dislikes. Our comfort lies in our confidence in in Jesus Christ. Now let me add a little bit more to that and I'm going to close. And his ability to lead and guide us. Are you trusting Jesus today? If your life is chaotic, and I'm just guessing that with all that's happened lately that everybody's had a little bit of chaos in their life. If your life is chaotic... If we're in a place where we don't know what to do. I, I've said this so many times in the past three months. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to approach this. But then I, I stop and I pray and I, I get on my face. And I put my confidence in Christ and we move from one thing to another. And God gets the glory and that's the main thing. We're trusting in his ability to provide. And if you'll do that, if you'll trust in his ability to provide... It will change your life. It will. I don't know what you're facing today, but I know that you don't have to face it alone. I know you can face it with Jesus. He may not take the problem from you, but he won't let you go through the problem alone. It may be today that out there on the Internet, it may be today that in here, some of you are thinking, I really need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And if you do, I want to encourage you to surrender to Him. It won't be comfortable making that decision. And it will likely be emotional. But you're not making a decision based on emotions. The emotions are coming because of the decision you've made to surrender to Christ. There's a difference. And if you've made that decision, if you're out in the internet today, if you're out in the cyber world today and you've made that decision, please call our office and let us help you get to where you need to get in your walk with Christ. Let us provide you with the materials that's needed. 
if you're sitting here today and you've made that decision, we're going to sing our invitation in a moment. But what I'm going to ask you to do is go to the decision guides in the back and let them escort you to the office. We don't, we don't, nobody will see you. You just tell them, I need to go to the office, and they'll take you right on in the office, and I'll come shortly, and we'll pray, and we'll talk, and we'll spend as much time as you need. But please, please count the cost today and ask yourself, are you ready? Are you ready to put Christ first in your life? Are you ready? Let us pray together. Father, as I come before you this, this morning, I want to thank you for this opportunity. The opportunity to share the gospel. The opportunity to have people present today is such a tremendous blessing. Father, I ask you to give us the strength to make a decision today to completely surrender to you. We need to calculate the cost. We need to know that when we surrender, there's no turning back, that we have to move forward. And I pray today, if there's anyone out there in, in cyberspace, if there's anyone that hears that mess this message, or anyone here today that needs to respond, that they will do so, not because I've instructed them to, but because the Holy Spirit has led them to. Father, I must decrease that you increase, and I pray for you to increase right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, Miss Debbie's going to lead us in an invitation. And if you need to make a decision, then by all means, you can go to the back. Or if you want to wait until we exit, you can go to the back. But if you need to come and pray, please come and pray. Just, if you would, social distance. But come and pray, Miss Debbie. Would you please be seated? I'm going to ask Mr. Dean if he'll make his way to the back because he is going to uh, help us dismiss. I do want you to know this as we get ready to dismiss that I love you and the Lord Jesus Christ loves you too. Thank you so much. Mr. Douglas is going to start us back here and I'll ask you, he'll take you one row at a time, so please follow his lead when this side is empty. Mr. Dean will begin on this side. Uh, emptying out on this side. We'll ask you to just keep moving, if you would, at, out of the church. <laughs>